Support for Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. The Redcoats! The Redcoats are marching! The regulars are coming out! Turn out! On the night of April 18, 1775, Paul Revere made his famous ride to Lexington, Massachusetts to warn John Hancock, Samuel Adams, and the townspeople that the regulars were marching. In response to the Boston Tea Party of 1773, Parliament passed a series of acts in 1774 known as the Coercive Acts. These laws were designed to punish Boston and to rein in its rebelliousness. Ultimately, Parliament hoped that the Coercive Acts would turn the people of Massachusetts against Boston. Parliament hoped that the Bay colonists would pressure the Bostonians to submit to imperial control. Instead, the acts incensed the people of Massachusetts and caused them to arm for war. Hoping to avoid armed conflict and to bring the Bay Colony back into line, British General Thomas Gage ordered Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith to march a force out by the Lexington Road, quote, with the utmost expedition and secrecy to Concord, where you will seize and destroy all artillery, ammunition, provisions, tents, small arms, and all military stores, whatever, end quote. About 700 British regulars took part in this expedition. Patriot leaders discovered Gage's plan and ordered Paul Revere to ride to Lexington to spread the alarm. Revere made an important ride on the night of April 18, but it wasn't his first ride as a Patriot or Rebel courier. In fact, Revere made several important rides between 1774 and 1775, including one in September 1774 that brought the Suffolk Resolves to the First Continental Congress. So why is it that we remember Paul Revere's ride to Lexington and not any of his other rides? Why is it that we remember Paul Revere on the night of April 18, 1775 and nothing else about his life before or after that famous ride? Why is it that Paul Revere seems to ride quickly into history and then just as quickly out of it? Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. So why is it that we remember Paul Revere's ride to Lexington and not any of his other rides? This is a really interesting question, and one that also leads me to wonder, why do we even remember Paul Revere? Because when we look at the history of the American Revolution as a whole, right, Paul Revere is a supporting actor. I mean, just search for Revere in books about the Revolution. I think you'll find that he really does seem to ride quickly into history and then just as quickly out of it. I think if we're to understand why it is that history remembers some people and events and not others, and why it is that some people seem to have such an odd staying power in our memory, we need to know more about memory, specifically historical memory and how it works. Sarah Purcell is the director of the Rosenfeld Program in Public Affairs and a professor of history at Grinnell College. She wrote a book that explored the history of historical memory around the American Revolution. It's called Sealed with Blood, War, Sacrifice, and Memory in Revolutionary America. I have a feeling that Sarah is just the person we need to ask about what historical memory is and how it works. Sarah, we're trying to better understand why we remember Paul Revere's ride to Lexington on April 18, 1775, and basically nothing else about this guy's life, like the other important rides he made as a rebel or patriot courier. In your book, Sealed with Blood, you note that public or national memory and history have much in common, but they're not the same thing. And I wonder if you would tell us about the differences between memory and history. Right. So they are not exactly the same, although they certainly converge at various times in various eras, especially of American history. In general, even starting in the early national years, so just after the revolution, history was really an attempt to document the past, document the facts. And it evolved into something that had an objective judgment of the past. Not everyone in the earliest years really hewed to a complete version of objectivity, but that they were intentionally writing an account of the past. 
And American history, the timeline developed along with the professionalization of the historical oppression. But even before, say, the 1840s or 50s, when historians became more professionalized and hence also more, quote, objective, history writing was an intentional pursuit to try to gather and to promote a particular version of the past that did have something to do with interpretation, but also had to do with preserving facts about the past. Historical memory or public memory or national memory is generally seen as something that is more organic. It's less intentional, and it's something that's put together by fits and pieces. So there are many pieces of print culture that comprise national memory, but it also might include things like parades or monuments or celebrations of anniversaries of events. So looking to the past for inspiration, but not just seeking to collect some kind of comprehensive interpretation or comprehensive account of the past, rather the collection of a lot of different individuals, maybe some official proclamations, some official commemorations, but also some more organic, ground up, bottom up, grassroots type of remembrances or commemorations. So it's a more diverse and a more open-ended kind of look to the past. When exactly did Americans start to create a national memory, and how did they use the American Revolution to create it? Yeah, well, really, Americans were creating memories that played into their national identity as soon as national identity was at issue. So I would say as soon as the American Revolution started, at least as soon as the Revolutionary War started, so right alongside Paul Revere's ride comes the beginning of national memory. Now, I will say there are probably some seeds of it, even in the imperial crisis leading up to the American Revolution. There was a way in which Americans looked to the past, sometimes paradoxically even the British past, like the glories of Magna Carta, for instance, to try and justify the positions they were taking in terms of natural rights, etc. But in terms of actually contributing to some idea of a nation that really comes alongside the revolution. So it takes place almost simultaneous with the events themselves. As soon as events happen, they start to be remembered both privately and publicly. And then those public remembrances kind of take on a life of their own and can spin out even at this point for hundreds of years, taking different byways and pathways, but sometimes having some themes in common that help contribute to national identity. Something that I've been interested in in particular is the way that the Revolutionary War as a military conflict occupied a really an outsized role in the memory of the revolution and the military aspects of the revolution played into national identity in a particular way. So it sounds like historical memory is something that changes over time, that it's not something that just remains static. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely changes over time because it also is something that is, as I said, coming from a variety of people within society. And so therefore, society and different groups within society have different needs at different times. And so memory can't really stay static in the same way that society itself is changing. So the things that are needed in American culture, the needs that are met through this kind of historical memory change as society itself changes. And I guess I would also say the people whose voices get heard as part of the memory also change. So, for instance, it's true that African Americans have always had a lot of memory within their own communities about public events, but only sometimes have their voices been a part of the national memory, the story that really gets told as part of what makes up the nation. That has changed over time as the status of African Americans has changed, just as one example, and that could be proliferated for a lot of other groups and individuals. This is really interesting because it sounds like historical memory is really about addressing the needs of the present and using history to address those needs, and that it's not really about history and trying to figure out what really happened in the past based on the facts we have. Exactly. Yeah, it's about how images of the past, whether through nostalgia or celebration or really a kind of malleable view of the past, can either support political ideologies or social programs, or even just Americans' own self-image of themselves at a number of points in the present. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the past is infinitely malleable. I mean, it's not possible just to make up anything about the past. 
but exactly which aspects of the past get remembered and how they get celebrated and by whom will change over time according to the needs of society at that present moment. So what is it about Paul Revere? What does our present day society need from Paul Revere that triggers us to decide that, hey, we're going to remember Revere and some of the events of his life, but not all the events and achievements of his life? Right. Well, I think that it has to do with Lexington and Concord in general, and actually the role of the beginning of the Revolutionary War. So the reason we remember Paul Revere's ride on April 18th into the 19th, rather than some of the other things Paul Revere did, is that the battles of Lexington and Concord take a very important role in American memory and in American history. And they're, you know, they were seen as soon as they happened as events that were earth-shatteringly important to the history of the world because they were seen in retrospect to be the beginning of the end for the British Empire in our part of North America. And they were seen to be the beginning of the United States of America. So I think even some of the other important rides that he made or other important contributions that he made, they weren't associated with Lexington and Concord in the same way. And that's why they weren't as remembered. I think the second thing is the reason we remember Paul Revere and not William Dawes or some of the other writers or people who were involved on the night of April 18th does have to do with some of the other things that Paul Revere did. So even though he is remembered because he's associated with Lexington and Concord, he was an important personage. He did have a lot of connections in the political world. He was known as an engraver and a silversmith. And early 19th century Americans, especially late 18th century Americans, liked someone with social prestige and a more elite profile. And I think Paul Revere fit that bill. So he could be kind of a common man and yet fit the bill of a kind of elite level hero at the same time. And that's partly how he stood out from the other crowd. If Revere was popular in the 19th century because, you know, he was a common man who turned elite, which seemed to be the dream of many at the time, why is he popular in the 21st century? Yeah, I think some of it is just a legacy of that 19th century because I think all the public commemoration of him takes on a life of its own. The presence of his memory in Boston, the Longfellow poem about him. So I suspect that in a way, it's a kind of a self-reifying quality of Paul Revere became important in the memory. And so therefore, he himself now has taken on this quality of a symbol. And I think that the other options have faded from the public memory so much that it's kind of a self-perpetuating machine of national memory at this point. And so unless something you know radical were to happen... It's probably unlikely that any other writer or any other accomplishment of Paul Revere's could kind of overcome the first 100 years of his memory. And I think we're kind of on replay now. I suspect that if you asked most people about Paul Revere, they could probably repeat a lot of things from mythology and from the 19th century image of him much more than they could the accurate 18th century history of him. And so it's this kind of self-perpetuating cycle of public memory. History and national memory have elements in common, but they're not the same thing. History is meant to document the past. It's meant to provide us with an intentionally objective record of what happened so that we can see how and why it happened. History is based on facts and interpretations of those facts. Memory, on the other hand, is organic and selective. As Sarah revealed, the whole point of a national or collective memory of the past is to give us stories that bind us together as a people. And if you think about it, It's really hard for people to unite around uncomfortable truths of the past, like the fact that the American Revolution was really a complicated, violent, and divisive event. No, for the purposes of forming and informing our national identity, that thing that binds us together as Americans, we need our memories to focus on the good bits. Bits like Paul Revere. Paul Revere reminds us of the battles of Lexington and Concord, those opening salvos and what would become the American War for Independence. A war that we Americans would win. And winning makes us happy. It is definitely something that we can unite around as a people. We also remember Revere because of his image. Revere is someone who is at once a common man and someone who rose up and became a wealthy businessman. Paul Revere is someone that we can aspire to become, even in our own 21st century. But is that really who Paul Revere was? Was he someone who was both a common man like us and a man of wealth and status? Or is one or both of these images of Revere 
just another piece of our selective memory. It seems like we have two questions here. Who is the man we remember as Paul Revere? And who is Paul Revere as a real person? Now, when I think of Paul Revere as a person, as a man, my mind immediately jumps to John Singleton Copley's portrait of him. And since they say a picture is worth a thousand words, perhaps Revere's portrait can tell us more about both the man we remember as Paul Revere and about the actual man who sat for it. We should revisit with one of our earlier guest historians here, Jane Kamensky, a professor of history at Harvard University and the Carl and Lily Forsheimer Foundation Director of the Schlesinger Library. Jane is the author of the award-winning book, A Revolution in Color, The World of John Singleton Copley. And I bet Jane can tell us a whole lot about Copley's portrait of Paul Revere. Jane, we're hoping you can shed some light on why we remember Paul Revere as we do. A silversmith who became a wealthy businessman and the famed writer who spread the alarm of the regulars' march to Lexington on April 18, 1775. And we think Copley's portrait of Revere might hold some answers for us. So would you tell us about Copley's portrait of Paul Revere? Who is Paul Revere, the artisan who sat for John Singleton Copley in 1768? So Copley painted Revere in 1768. As you said, we think probably in the summer around the same time that Revere himself fashioned his Liberty Bowl commemorating the refusal of most Massachusetts assemblymen to rescind their letter in protest of imperial legislation earlier that year. And we know very little about the way that the portrait was commissioned. At that point, Copley was making about 11 pounds a piece for a bust length portrait, like the one that he painted of Revere, which is head and shoulders is bisected by a table, sort of stopping at about Revere's waist. And 11 pounds was a lot of what Revere would have made in a year like that. It's about as much as he would have made for a major commission like the teapot that he's holding in his hand in Copley's portrait. He holds a silver teapot leaning on a leather pad and contemplates it. So we don't know who would have purchased this luxury good. A portrait is a luxury good like a silver teapot is a luxury good. And it seems in some ways unlikely that it was Revere himself. I think it is in many ways one of the major mind's eye pictures of revolutionary Americans that people in the contemporary United States carry around with them. You've seen it even if you don't know you've seen it because it's sort of bowdlerized on the label of Sam Adams beer bottles which is a likeness much closer to Revere than Adams. And I think like Longfellow's poem about Paul Revere's ride, Copley's portrait shows an image of revolutionary America that's very comfortable for a lot of us. So it's highly individualized, right? It's one man stark against a black background. He's a plain man. He's wearing his own natural hair, no fancy powdered wig. He's got a deep green woolen vest on, also a kind of humble material with no gold lace, a minimum of buttons, and he's wearing linen shirt sleeves. He's got an open white linen shirt without fancy cuffs or embroidery or any of the sort of frippery that would have marked most men of parts in Revere's day. He looks right at the viewer, Copley's Revere does, as if to say... I'm not lesser than you because I work with my hands. I'm not going to turn away. There's no deference. It seems like a plain man in a plain hairstyle and plain shirt who's as good as any man. And I think that's very consistent with the sort of lone wolf writer of Longfellow's poem, an image which we know was not at all true to the way that Revere's Ride came together or to the way that the Sons of Liberty were organizing in the summer of 1768. The clothing that Revere wore in his portrait, the plain linen shirt, the vest with a few buttons, combined with him looking straight at you as your equal, makes Revere seem like he's one of us, a common everyday person. And Copley painted Revere in 1768, well before we developed our collective idea of who Paul Revere was. So, Could we explore this image of Revere a bit more? Who chose how Revere would be staged in his portrait? He's both a common man, an artisan, a man of materials, and a man of ideas. So that like Copley's portrait of himself, Copley did a pastel portrait of himself about a year later upon his marriage in the fall of 1769, which is 
as unlike the image of Revere in most ways as you could possibly imagine. It's elaborate and sort of a peacock to Revere's hen. But both of them are men who work with their hands. There's a real focus on the intensity of their eyes and their forehead, the light of imminent genius hitting Revere's forehead. So he's not shown making, he's shown contemplating the wares of his hands in that teapot. So a common man, but a common man capable of high thought, which is the way that Copley showed himself. One of my colleagues here at Harvard, Ethan Lasser in the Harvard Art Museum, has written about the Revere portrait's likeness to a shop sign. You could almost imagine it hanging over a silver shop in the street, showing the sort of plain, honest intensity of labor that goes on. In art historical terms, the picture has very little depth of field. It's very surfacy and planar and flat like a shop sign. It has a kind of elaborately staged naturalness. You know, the effects that Copley gets in that portrait are nature punched up and highlighted and dramatically contrasted with actually unnatural lighting effects, but it's supposed to look as if he's just caught almost unawares. And I think from the time that the portrait began to be seen publicly, seen somewhat in the 19th century and doesn't come into a museum until the 1930s when it comes to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston from Revere's descendants. But from the time it came to be seen publicly outside of whatever context Revere displayed it, it did chime with what Americans thought Americans should look like. And projecting ourselves back into revolutionary times, that worked for people who were thinking, say, at the time of the American bicentennial on forward with their mind's eye picture of what a revolutionary should be. In your book, A Revolution in Color, you state that Copley's portrait of Revere is both highly finished and elaborately staged, and that the portrait is a paradox. We've talked a bit about how the portrait was staged, and now I wonder if we could talk about why it's a paradox. I think it's a paradox because it's a luxury artifact of a quite ordinary artisanal man. It has as much contrivance in it and showiness about things like how you can paint linen that looks soft and folded and silver that looks shimmering and create the illusion of a teapot that looks like it would weigh a couple of pounds if you held it in your hands. You know, that's pyrotechnically challenging for an artist to make it look like he's not there. So that's a paradox. I think there are other paradoxes about its context. So painted in the summer or fall of 1768, at the time that the troops are landing, a moment that Revere would later famously engrave with that terrific view of the harbor loaded up with troop ships and longboats and British flags flying everywhere. And it's easy for us to assume, especially when we see the way that the Museum of Fine Arts displays it, that Copley and Revere shared a worldview. This too is a kind of paradox. They didn't exactly share it, and the worldview itself was not yet terribly coherent. So one of the things I talk about in the book is that Copley painted General Thomas Gage in very close proximity to when he painted Revere. And when Gage came to Boston that fall, most of Boston, including many Sons of Liberty, were very eager to greet him sociably, to bask in the opportunities that the visit of such a high official of the British Empire represented to Bostonians. So I think the sense of partisanship, that we're looking at a liberty man, I think that too is more complex than what we see when we look at the portrait in the Museum of Fine Arts. It's the first thing you see as you walk in the main ground floor door of the Art of the Americas wing, and the Liberty Bowl is in front of it in a plexiglass vitrine, almost like a chalice in front of the Priest of Liberty. I think the politics of the surround of that portrait, even at its moment in 1768, are considerably more complex than that. What does the fact that Revere sat to Copley tell us about Revere the man? Well, that's a great question. And I think the answer is we really don't know because we don't know about the commission of that portrait. You know, if Revere devoted a substantial portion of his income for the year 1768, which was a pretty lean year for him, to the purchase of a Copley portrait, 
it shows a deeper investment in self-fashioning than we would traditionally assume about a man whom Longfellow has made us believe was deeply selfless, could show a kind of vanity. Portrait subjects were often accused of vanity, and portraitists were accused of catering to vanity, making their living on vanity. But we don't at all know that Revere paid for it. You know, it may show the relationships of patronage that he himself had, that wealthier men would have paid to have such an object made on his behalf. It may show something about the network of liberty men at that point still agitating for British liberty, along with American liberty, the network of liberty men and the place that they put him in, in that web of political interests. I think what it doesn't show is a political program around homespun cloth and tea. It's easy to look back from 1773 and say, oh, look, there is Revere in 1768 contemplating what a vexed good the tea that goes in that teapot would be. But in fact, there's just no evidence that anyone was thinking with that specificity about tea at that moment in Boston at all. And what is it about Paul Revere, do you think, that triggers society to remember some people in events and not other people in events? You know, I think Copley's portrait has a lot to do with it. You know, the sort of perfect storm of Copley's portrait and Longfellow's poem. When we look back on history, whether it's the remote or the distant past, and for a United States event horizon, the revolution is the quite distant past, it really helps us to be able to see people. I find this all the time when I'm teaching that the voices that students gravitate to are the ones for which I can show them portraits and they know what that guy looked like. So, you know, we have a mythic voice that Longfellow creates in the era of the Civil War, and we have a face that we can put to it thanks to Copley. Revere was not one of the first names on people's lips in the mouths of his countrymen in the 1760s and early 1770s. And without that portrait, I don't know whether we would remember him quite as well as we do today. So it turns out a picture may not be worth a thousand words. At least not a thousand words that can answer our question of who Paul Revere was as a real person. As Jane revealed, Copley's portrait really can't answer this question for us because we don't know who commissioned the portrait or who paid for it. Like Jane said, it seems kind of unlikely that Revere would have spent 11 pounds on a portrait, given that he would have only expected to make about 11 pounds for the whole year in 1768. Now, with that said, Copley's portrait of Revere does tell us a whole lot about how we remember Paul Revere and why we remember him. In combination with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride, Copley's portrait plays to our own self-fashioning as Americans. It portrays Revere as someone we can imagine ourselves being. Thoughtful, selfless, hardworking. Copley makes Revere accessible and knowable to us. He also makes him more memorable. Because, as Jane noted, we tend to envision and remember the past best when we know what and who it looked like. But who was Paul Revere as a real person? This is a question we still haven't answered. Therefore, it seems like we need to pay a visit to the people who know Paul Revere and the historical record he left behind the best. The scholars at the Paul Revere Memorial Association, caretakers and interpreters of the Paul Revere House in Boston's North End neighborhood. Specifically, we should speak with the Paul Revere Memorial Association's research director, Patrick Leahy. Pat, we'd like to know more about who Paul Revere was as a real living person. Would you tell us about Paul Revere's early life? Sure. He was born here in the North End, which is where the Revere House Museum is today. In fact, not too far from where the museum is. And he was educated in what was called a writing school, which is kind of like a modern-day elementary school. And then he apprenticed with his father to be a, a silversmith, or he called himself a goldsmith, which is how the trade was referred to in those days. Goldsmiths worked in both gold and silver. Because they worked mostly in silver, we tend to call them silversmiths, but they would refer to themselves as goldsmiths. And Revere's father was a French immigrant. He was also of Huguenot descent and arrived in the early 1700s, and he also apprenticed with a local goldsmith. Revere's mother was named Deborah Hitchborn, and she was a descendant of families who had been here for several generations. Paul Revere's father's name, on the other hand, was originally Apollos Revoir, French name, and Apollos eventually changed his name to Paul Revere, 
So what that means is that the famous Paul Revere was not the first. His father was known as Paul Revere for most of his life. What was it like for Revere to be an apprentice and to work and learn from someone like his father? Well, being an apprentice was actually written up like an indenture. It was, you spent however long the term was, usually seven years, sometimes 10 years, sometimes less. It could be almost any length of time. And in return for free labor, you were taught a trade. So what that meant was in the early days, you'd be mostly learning and not really providing much value to the master craftsman. And later on, you'd be providing quite a bit of value, whereas you weren't being paid. It was a good system for learning hands-on trades like silversmithing. And some trades, some apprenticeships were extremely valuable, and you often had to pay to have your boy be apprenticed with someone. And uh, some of the lesser trades, the uh, craftsman had to pay to get apprentices. In Revere's case, since he apprenticed with his father, none of that mattered. And it was a long day. You'd spend five or six days at work, probably from sunup till sundown. So it was longer in the summer than it was in the winter. And it was, you know, hands-on work. So some of it was considerably strenuous. Other times there'd be downtime when you didn't have orders to fill. And you'd probably spend some time like delivering silver that was already made to people around town. So it was kind of an education in itself, aside from learning the trade. What was Paul Revere's place in the world? We know that colonial society had a hierarchy and that there was a hierarchy in the trades too. So where did goldsmithing or silversmithing fit within the colonial tradecraft hierarchy? Silversmithing was one of the highest ranking trades, whereas oddly enough, things like tailoring and shoemaking were fairly low on the pecking order. Silversmithing was one of the highest ranking trades, probably because you're dealing with precious metals. And you could actually make a pretty good living as a silversmith, but there was kind of a limit to how much you could make. Eventually, Revere decided he wanted to move up a little farther than that. And after the Revolutionary War, he got involved in other businesses. How did Revere become involved in revolutionary politics? Would you tell us that story? That's a good question. We don't actually know in a sense, because one of the difficulties with Paul Revere as a historical figure and also as a biographical subject is that he did not keep a diary. And he did not write very many personal letters. So we don't really know exactly why he became involved on the revolutionary side. We can guess. Many craftspeople were dependent upon the upper classes here in Boston for a lot of their business. And the upper classes in particular were hit pretty hard by British tax measures in the years before the Revolutionary War. There's also another possibility, too, which I've thought about, is Paul Revere was of Huguenot descent. And he would have heard stories from his father about how Huguenots in France were persecuted, and especially when troops were quartered in towns in France in the 1680s, supposedly to preserve Catholicism, but in fact to try to enforce the conversion of French Protestants back to Catholicism. And these were called Dragonades. And when the British troops arrived here in force in the 1760s, in 1768 in particular, I think this might have stirred some sort of ancestral memories, or just from stories Revere had heard as this was something pretty bad that governments were doing. So there might have been a personal reason, but it might also have been simply he agreed with the people who were opposing British policies. The problem is, strictly speaking, from historical record, we don't know. Wasn't Revere involved in Freemasonry too? And as we happen to know, a lot of revolutionaries were also Masons. So could it be a possibility that Revere became involved with revolutionary politics through Freemasonry? Probably some role, yes. The ideals of Freemasonry, which were 18th century Enlightenment ideals, more or less, they would have been antagonistic to an effort by a government to be too authoritarian. So it might have had something to do with it. It is true that many of the revolutionaries were Freemasons, and there would have been a lot of camaraderie through the Masonic lodges. So that may have had something to do with it. One interesting thing is is that Paul Revere belonged to a group called the North Caucus. And the North Caucus very often met at a uh, tavern called the Green Dragon Tavern. And the Green Dragon Tavern was also known as Freemasons Arms because it was actually owned by a Masonic Lodge. And it was the Masonic Lodge that Revere belonged to. So in that sense, there was a connection. However, we have lists of people who were in the Masonic Lodge and also one list anyway of people who were in the North Caucus. And you'd expect to see a lot of overlap in the membership, but there actually isn't that much. But the Masonic Lodge must have known exactly what was going on when the North Caucus met there. Would you tell us more about the North Caucus and Revere's involvement with it? The North Caucus was one of many actual political groups that were operating here in Boston in the 1760s and 1770s. Like Americans today, colonial Americans in the 18th century did tend to join a lot of things. And Revere in particular joined quite a few groups. There was a North Caucus, there was a Middle Caucus, there was a Southern Caucus. They started as groups that met sort of informally to nominate candidates for political offices. 
but eventually they became kind of an underground network of politically active people who opposed British government policies in those years in the 1760s and 1770s. And Masonic lodges, to some extent, functioned the same way. Do we know how Revere would have participated in the North Caucus? We do, to some extent. Like I said, there's one membership list, and there are also some minutes from some of the meetings in the months just before the Boston Tea Party. And Revere was a pretty active member. And the group functioned like many formal social groups functioned. They had a moderator, and they appointed committees to wait upon important people to get their opinions about things. And Revere was a member of several committees that were appointed to try to, uh, to work out the problems that had to do with the Tea Act, which, as we know, weren't worked out soon enough. He's a pretty active member. When we think of Boston, we often think of the Sons of Liberty, especially when we're talking about an event like the Boston Tea Party. Do we know if Revere was a Son of Liberty and what he would have done if he was one? Yes. The Sons of Liberty is a sort of vexed question to talk about because trying to figure out exactly what it was isn't always that easy, especially since the term kind of changed over the years. Initially, the Sons of Liberty started out as merchants associations that were organized to oppose the Stamp Act. Eventually, the term Sons of Liberty came to refer to anyone who opposed British government policies in the 1760s and 1770s. So it was just a way of people sort of referring to other people. They say so-and-so is, you know, is a good son of liberty, so-and-so is a high son of liberty, etc. But it wasn't a centralized, organized group. You sometimes hear that there was a central organization, that Samuel Adams was the head of it, that they had special signs, they had special medallions that they would have to show in order to get into meetings, that I think all of this is largely mythology. So we may not know exactly how Revere came to be a revolutionary, but we do know for certain that he belonged to several organizations that had ties to the revolutionary cause. Would you tell us about the work he did specifically to further the cause of the revolution? Largely what Revere did were two things. One, as an engraver, which he was, in addition to being a silversmith, he was an engraver. He did copper plate engravings, which he did as part of his business. He would use that skill to print political cartoons. And some of them have become very famous, like the Boston Massacre engraving, and others are less well-known. But there's probably a couple dozen of them, and they were published in broadsides or in local magazines. And many of them were copied from British originals, which is a whole interesting topic in and of itself. Where did Revere get his originals? What did he work from? Because most engravers didn't claim to be original artists. They were basically uh, transferring a picture onto a copper plate for printing purposes. But that was one thing that Revere did. The other thing he did, which began in 1773, was he served as a paid courier for the Committee of Safety. And that's what he's most famous for, particularly his famous midnight ride. But also, he was riding from Boston to New York and Philadelphia several times in the 1773 and 1774 time period to bring news and carry copies of important documents back and forth. So those are the two main things that he did. He may have taken part in the Boston Tea Party. He's credited with having done that. Whether he actually did or not, we don't know. You noted that Revere worked as a rebel courier. How did a silversmith become a courier? And how many rides did he make on behalf of the revolutionary cause? How he became a courier is a good question, because having experience riding a horse is not something you'd expect the average craftsman to know about. Horses were actually not very common in colonial towns. Most people walked to get around. And in the countryside, they weren't even that common because people use oxen to do the plowing although people did use horses to get around between town to town. Somewhere or another, Revere had gotten experience riding a horse because you don't just hop on a horse and go riding off just because you sort of want to do that. You have to have experience. So you presume that he got experience somewhere. And he was known as having that experience. He also was a trusted person in the patriot political circles, to call them that. And having that skill, that he would be sort of a natural person to choose to carry copies of, you know, important documents and also the latest news from one colony to another. And that's the main purpose that he served. He probably went on about a dozen courier rides, maybe a few more than that. And in one case, he carried copies of the Suffolk Resolves to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia and then brought back their response to it. So that would be a pretty typical thing that Revere would have done. Yeah, the Suffolk Resolves ride was really important. So would you tell us about the Suffolk Resolves and about the ride Revere made to carry them to the First Continental Congress in September 1774? The Suffolk Resolves were a result of a county convention that was held in the fall of 1774, and it was held in defiance of the what were called the Coercive Acts, which were a number of laws that were passed by the British Parliament in response to the Boston Tea Party. 
And in particular, one of the coercive acts was known as the Massachusetts Government Act, which there was a great antagonism to that because it overthrew the existing Massachusetts Charter. It rearranged the government so most government officials would be appointed or at least paid from England. And it was considered to be, especially in the countryside outside of Boston, it was considered to be completely unwarranted and illegal and was essentially not obeyed. And when the new officials appointed under the Government Act showed up to try to take up their offices or, in the case of judges, to come into their courthouse, they were met by large crowds who forced them to resign. One of the things that the Coercive Acts did is that it outlawed town meetings, or at least the way they had been held. You could hold them, but they were largely controlled by the government. But county meetings were not in the Coercive Acts. And so various counties, and particularly Suffolk County, which is where Boston is, they held their county convention, and they adopted a document known as the Suffolk Resolves, which largely written by Dr. Joseph Warren, who was a patriot leader here in Boston, and it declared that the coercive acts were unconstitutional. That's the first thing. Because they were unconstitutional, it advised the colony of Massachusetts to form its own government and to collect taxes and withhold them from the colonial government until such time as the coercive acts were repealed. And there was a couple of other measures, but those are the most important ones. And Suffolk resolves were carried by Paul Revere to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, who adopted them and then sent back their response to it that they were adopting the Suffolk resolves. So Revere's ride to Philadelphia in September 1774 was a pretty big deal. Yes. I mean, because after Revere brought the Suffolk resolves to Philadelphia, the First Continental Congress adopted them. And by doing so, they declared the coercive acts as unconstitutional and they pledged to arm for war. That's correct. One of the things that they also were advised to do was to form their own militias. That's true. So yeah, you're getting very close to open rebellion at that point, which basically in the countryside in Massachusetts, the countryside had already revolted anyway, because they'd already essentially brought the British administration to a standstill. The British at that point, by the fall of 1774, no longer really controlled the Massachusetts countryside. The only thing they really controlled was the town of Boston. And this was the situation where Paul Revere's ride took place. And it helps also to explain the reason why it took place, that situation being the way it was. Now, Pat, as you noted earlier, Paul Revere made his famous ride, the one we all remember, out to Lexington on April 18, 1775. Would you tell us about the details of the real ride that Paul Revere made? We actually know a lot about Revere's ride because he wrote about it. He wrote about it several times, once right after the war broke out, and then once at a later date when the man who was organizing the Massachusetts Historical Society asked Revere to write down everything he could remember about what had happened. And we know that Revere was sent for by Dr. Joseph Warren, the last patriot leader who was left here in Boston. And when he got to Dr. Warren's house, he found out, number one, that a large number of British troops, and there were a lot of troops stationed in Boston at the time, were going to march into the countryside, which was no surprise. Everyone knew that was going to happen. It was just a question where they were going. The assumption was they would be going towards Concord, where the Patriots had collected a lot of powder and ammunition and even some cannon that they had sneaked out of Boston. They might also have been going to Worcester or some other directions as well. It wasn't totally clear, but it was definitely clear that they were leaving Boston. But also, Dr. Warren had gotten intelligence from his own spy network that the British troops were going to stop in the town of Lexington and arrest Samuel Adams and John Hancock, who were staying at a house there. And the only reason they were there is John Hancock had some relatives that lived in Lexington. Most of the other members of the Committee of Safety, which was sort of the de facto revolutionary executive at the time, they were farther away from Boston, but Adams and Hancock were staying in Lexington. And it turns out the intelligence that the British were going to stop and arrest them was not right. That was incorrect. The British had no orders to arrest anyone. But that's what the Patriots thought, and that's the information that Revere operated under. After Revere talked to Mr. Warren, he came back to his own neighborhood. He contacted a friend to climb up into the church tower, the Old North Church, to set the famous signals one if by land, two if by sea, which really should be one if by land, two if by river, because the troops were either going to march out Boston Neck and around Back Bay, which was the land route in those days, or they were going to take small boats across the Charles River, which would have been a bit of a shortcut if you're traveling northwest of Boston. And the other issue about the lantern signals is, according to the famous poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Paul Revere was waiting across the river for the signals at the time they were shown, which is not correct. Revere was still in Boston when the signals were shown. The signals were not for Paul Revere in Charlestown. They were from Paul Revere to the Patriots in Charlestown in case Revere was unable to leave town. And he had very sensibly figured he might be stopped. There's a whole issue of did Longfellow know the real story? And the answer is almost certainly he did. But he was a poet. He was not a um, historian. And he was using it as a vehicle to try to warn the American Union that it was in danger. This is in the summer of 1860, right before the Civil War broke out. 
So he was using the story for another purpose. He wasn't trying to write history, but it's become kind of the accepted story of Revere's ride. Anyway, Revere contacted a friend to climb up into the church tower to set the signals. Then he stopped by his own house, which is the museum today, picked up his boots and his overcoat, and he walked up to the waterfront where a couple friends had a small boat hidden behind a wharf. They rowed him across the river. He then borrowed a horse from a friend and set off through the countryside. He did not say the British are coming, the British are coming. We don't know what he said at each of the houses along the road, but we do know exactly what he said when he got to the town of Lexington because there was a guard on duty outside the house where Samuel Adams and John Hancock were staying, and that guard later on wrote down what happened. He said that he saw this man right up. He told him not to make so much noise that everybody in the house was asleep because that's what he'd been told to say. And Revere got a little annoyed at the man and said, noise? You'll have noise enough before long. The regulars are coming out. There was still some trouble getting into the house, but eventually he was able to get in. And he warned Adams and Hancock to get out of the way because they were afraid that they might be the object of the British troops. Revere and then another man who had been sent from Boston, a man named William Dawes, who was often forgotten about, he had actually left before Revere, but he had taken the land route to Lexington, so it took him a little longer. Revere and Dawes decided to go on to the town of Concord to verify and make sure that all the military supplies had been properly hidden away. Along the road, they were joined by a third man, and then they were stopped by a British patrol. The third man, Dr. Prescott, did get away. He warned the militia in Lincoln and also in Concord. Dawes also escaped under rather mysterious circumstances. We're not sure exactly how, but Revere was held for quite a while. He was threatened, but he was eventually released, but his horse was confiscated, and so that was the end of his midnight riding for that night. Revere's midnight ride may have ended, but did he participate in either of the battles at Lexington or Concord, you know, since he was already in Lexington? No, he did not. And he would not have expected himself to, because he was not a member of either the militia in Lexington or of any of the local militias, for that matter, except for maybe the Boston militia. So he wouldn't have expected himself to. He sort of had other business to attend to. But his ride was successful, right, in that men turned out to fight in these battles at Lexington and Concord? Oh, yeah, because everywhere Revere stopped along the road, whoever he alarmed, other riders were sent off in other directions. So eventually the alarm reached as far as southern New Hampshire and northern Connecticut. And by the time the British finally got to Concord, and they were quite slow getting anywhere that night, there were, you know, several thousand militia waiting for them. Now, Revere may not have served at the battles of Lexington and Concord, but he did serve in the Massachusetts militia between 1776 and 1779. Pat, would you tell us about Revere's military service? Well, it's not much to write home about, to be honest. He wanted a commission in the Continental Army, which he was not able to get. He was an artillery officer in the Massachusetts Provincial Army or the Massachusetts Militia. Most of the three years that he served, he was stationed on Castle Island, which was a fort in Boston Harbor. And his job was to stay on guard in case the British ever tried to come back to Boston. They had evacuated in March of 1776. They never did. So a lot of his duty came down to trying to keep his men in order and presiding over innumerable courts martial to deal with minor disciplinary problems. He did take part in a couple of local expeditions to Rhode Island and Worcester, Massachusetts, and then also one large expedition that went up to Maine in the summer of 1779 to try to capture a small British fort in the Penobscot Bay. And that expedition turned into a major failure because all of the ships were lost. The colonial officers didn't do a very good job. There was a lot of dissension between the Army and the Navy officers. The British relief squadron showed up, and all the ships were lost. There was a lot of recrimination about who was really to blame for the failure of the expedition. Most of the blame fell to Dudley Saltonstall, who was the overall commander of the expedition, who was also conveniently from Connecticut, so you could blame them. You know, not being a Massachusetts man, we can dump the blame on Connecticut. But Revere himself was accused by several of his own subordinate officers of cowardice and insubordination. And there was a board of inquiry, which didn't really rule on Revere's case one way or the other. And Revere decided he wanted a court-martial to try to clear his name. It took him quite a while to get it, but eventually he did get it, and he was found formally not guilty of all charges. By that time, the war had pretty much ended, and Revere had gone back to his business activities. But the Penobscot expedition probably did guarantee that Revere would never move up any farther in the political world. Let's put it that way. Would you tell us more about Revere's post-war activities? Because it seems like Revere became really active in business and made quite the career for himself after the war. He did. After the war, he wanted to move up in the world. Silversmithing was a good ranking trade, but it was a trade. It was not the same as being a merchant or a lawyer or something like that. His plan was to use the profits from the silver shop to try to invest in new businesses. What he did is he turned the day-to-day operations of the silver shop over to his oldest son, who was also named Paul Revere. And then he used the profits to invest in new businesses. 
He tried to be a hardware store merchant for a while. That didn't really work out very well, partly because he had some very practical problems, but I also think his heart really wasn't in it because Revere had always made things for a living and just retailing them, I think probably didn't really appeal to him all that much, really. Anyway, when something better came along, he sort of jumped at it. He established a a Bell & Cannon foundry in the north end of Boston. He supplied a cannon to many of the state governments and also to the national governments. And he manufactured bells, which are the more spectacular items that he made, but was only really a relatively small part of the overall business. Many churches in New England have got bells that were made in the Revere foundry. And then in around 1800, he bought an old iron mill south of Boston, which he converted into a mill for rolling sheet copper. And sheet copper was used to line the outsides of ships, most famously the USS Constitution in 1804, not as armor, but as protection against shipworms and various other nautical pests. He also provided heavy copper sheets to Robert Fulton in New York to manufacture boilers for many of the steamboats. And the copper mill and foundry did make Revere fairly wealthy by the time that he died. Revere was a silversmith, which was a highly skilled trade. But casting bells and cannon and rolling copper seemed like entirely different types of manufacturing. How did Revere learn how to operate a foundry and how to roll copper? That's kind of a remarkable thing that he was able to accomplish because you're right. It is metals. And so he was essentially a trained metaller just being a silversmith. But it's a very different kind of metal. And the casting that you do as a silversmith, like casting spouts for teapots, compare that to trying to cast something large like a bell. I mean, it's quite a bit different. And Revere did take advantage of some experienced bell casters. But a lot of the business he learned himself. He was able to take his writing school education, which is like a modern-day eighth-grade education, and manage to read enough about bell casting and get enough help from people who were experienced bell casters to actually learn the business himself, which is kind of remarkable that he was able to do that. And the same way with setting up a rolling mill to roll sheet copper. He had learned to roll like small sheets of silver for his silversmithing business, but rolling, you know, two and a half foot wide by three foot long sheets of copper would be, you know, considerably larger enterprise. And again, he took advantage of as much technology as he could learn about, but largely he had to figure the business out himself, and he was able to do it. So he's kind of like, you know, pretty sharp individual to be able to do that. And it sounds like his work had national importance. I mean, he was casting cannon that the United States used in its naval vessels, and he rolled the copper that protected its hulls. Plus, he helped Robert Fulton manufacture the boilers he needed for his pioneering steamboats. Yeah, that's right. It did have national import, and also, from Revere's point of view, He was providing items which he could get government contracts for, which was a big plus for him, that it was, you know, a nice steady source of business doing work for the government, especially during the uh, administration of John Adams from 1797 to 1801, because John Adams, he knew personally. And so he was able to get good business contracts when Adams was president. There was one hang up, though, because when he was trying to set up his copper mill, he had actually sunk a lot of his own assets into buying the old iron mill and converting it into a mill for rolling sheet copper, which involved considerable investment in machinery and things like that. And he had done this with the understanding that the government was going to give him a loan. When the Jefferson administration took over in 1800, in those days, it was unclear whether any particular administration had to honor contracts entered into by the previous administration. And at first, the Jefferson administration was not planning to honor that particular contract he had made with Revere. And Revere got, I mean, this is, Revere wrote several, you know, like, I suppose, pleading long letters to the government saying that, you know, I've done all this. I'm planning to provide sheet copper for the government. If you don't come through with a loan, I may very well be on the verge of bankruptcy. Eventually, the Jefferson administration did decide to honor the loan, and Revere did get the money, which he then paid off in copper. As he rolled the sheets, he delivered them to the government, and little by little, he paid off the loan. Revere is definitely a man with a lot of myths that surround his memory. Knowing the man behind the myth, what do you think the lasting legacy of Paul Revere is today? Well, I think probably he serves as an example of a person delivering a warning. I think that's what his main image is, and a lot of that does come from the famous Longfellow poem. And the poem was kind of important because if it wasn't for that poem, most likely Revere never would have become the national folk hero that he is today, and most likely the Revere House never would have been saved because Revere would have been a rather minor Revolutionary War character, as he actually was. He was important locally, but he certainly wasn't important nationally. So he did serve as a warning against dangers, against dangers that are uh, affecting either local society or the nation as a whole. For example, today the image of Paul Revere might be used to warn people about global warming, for example, might be used to warn people about the increase of the national debt, 
Or you could almost connect him with, like, for example, the people we call whistleblowers, you know, people who uh, tell people there's something sort of important going on which you ought to know about. So that's his primary image. And it's usually Paul Revere as if he was by himself, as if it was just him, whereas actually Revere was part of a much larger warning system, which in those days was called the Lexington Alarm. So it was a, uh, let me say, a pretty typical British method of raising a hue and cry in the case of imminent danger. So it was assumed that there would be riders who would be riding off in different directions. You'd also ring bells. You'd also fire cannon. It was a way of warning a large part of the countryside that some danger was approaching. And so it was much more of a collective event in Revere's day. But the image of Revere is of the lone rider crying in alarm. I suppose whistleblower is kind of close to how we might think of him. And as you do know so much about Paul Revere and his life and legacy, is his legacy something that has changed over time? Or is his legacy as a whistleblower or a bearer of alarms something that has stayed pretty constant? That's stayed pretty constant, but I think some other aspects of his life have been looked into more, especially recently. One thing is that after a while, Revere became pretty well known for his silversmithing ability, as large collections of his silver were donated to the Museum of Fine Arts and were collected in other art museums, for example. And then even more recently, people have looked into Revere as the kind of forerunner of the Industrial Revolution, as a craftsman who got involved in manufacturing, even though he probably would have still thought of himself as a craftsman, but he was sort of a uh, forerunner of the Industrial Revolution. So in that sense, he was fairly important for that reason, maybe even more important than some other things that he's credited for. Paul Revere was a silversmith, revolutionary, and businessman. He was a talented man who worked his way to wealth, and he was also a man with a bit of mystery around him. Since he didn't keep a diary or write many letters, we don't really know how and why he became involved in revolutionary politics. As Pat noted, the historical record provides us with three possibilities for why Revere became a revolutionary. One, he may have joined the revolution out of solidarity with the upper class, because he was dependent upon them for his livelihood and because imperial taxation hit that class the hardest. Two, Revere may have participated in the revolution because his friends did. We know he was an active member in at least two groups that supported the revolution and its principles, the Freemasons and the North Caucus. Three, the landing of British troops in Boston in 1768 may have stirred Revere's collective memory about the time in the 1680s when crown soldiers landed in French towns and persecuted his ancestors, So, Revere may have joined the revolution and worked to further its cause as a way to help his fellow Bostonians and Americans avoid a fate similar to that of the Huguenots. But regardless of how and why Revere became a revolutionary, we know that he served the cause. He served the cause by engraving political cartoons and images that shaped the way Britons around the globe viewed Boston's side of the imperial crisis. He also served the cause as a courier, someone who carried vital news and information as far south as Philadelphia. Now, Revere's work as a courier is important. In September 1774, he carried the Suffolk Resolves to the First Continental Congress, which adopted them, and in doing so, aligned the other colonies with Massachusetts and pledged the other colonies to arm for war. So, why is it that we don't remember this ride in our collective memory? Because it seems like an important early victory for Massachusetts and the Revolution. Is it because this ride doesn't precede a battle? Or could the answer of why we don't remember this ride really be because of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow? Each of our guests, Sarah Jane and Pat, mentioned Longfellow in his 1860 poem, Paul Revere's Ride. They noted that the poem has contributed greatly to our collective memory of Revere. They said it's the poem that tells us what we know about Revere, what we've forgotten about him, and why we even remember him. It seems like we can't know why we remember Paul Revere the way we do, or why it is he seems to ride quickly into history and then just as quickly out of it, until we investigate Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and his poem, Paul Revere's Ride. For this exploration, we'll need to speak with Christoph Ermster, the Provost Professor of English and the George F. Getz Junior Professor of the Wells Scholars Program at Indiana University, Bloomington. Christoph is an expert on Longfellow and his work and he detailed his knowledge in a book called Longfellow Redux. Christoph, we're trying to get a better understanding of the staying power Paul Revere has in our collective memory. And it seems like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow played a big role in making Paul Revere and his April 18th ride stick in our minds. So would you tell us about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow 
and how and why he became a poet? Probably the first thing to know about me was born in Portland, Maine, and that city had a great influence on him, something that he kept going back to in his memory. Uh, he was born 27th February 1807. His father was a lawyer. He was the second of eight children, and he started out as a poet essentially when he was a teenager. He published his first poem when he was 13, which was actually on a colonial topic. It was a, the Battle of Lovell's Pond, which was published in the Portland Gazette. It was simply signed Henry. So he did see himself as a poet pretty early on in his life. His father was not very appreciative of his career choice, basically, and pointed out to Longfellow that there was not, as he said, wealth enough in this country to afford encouragement to merely literary men. That's the quote from a letter that he sent him. And in part, I think it will probably be correct to say that Longfellow became a poet despite his father and to show him that it can actually be done. He went to Bowdoin College, again in Maine. Same class as Nathaniel Hawthorne, who did not excel in college, as opposed to Longfellow, who was a very avid student, translator, you know, picked up languages very quickly. And he did respect his father's wish in a sense that he picked a respectable profession. He was appointed a professor of modern languages at Bowdoin College, and that's how he started out. So one of the interesting things about Longfellow is that he was a literary scholar as well as a poet, and that he taught literature for a living. He taught languages. He taught literature. He really is sort of the founding father in some ways of what we now regard as comparative literature. And his poetry was always influenced by his reading, by things that he picked up from the literatures of Europe for the most part. He's extraordinary in the 19th century in that he spoke nine languages fluently and probably was able to read a dozen more. We can tell that because we still have his library. We can look at his annotations. We can look at the books that he had. And we do have accounts from people who visited him that he was fluent in, you know, you name it, French, Spanish, Italian. He spoke Dutch. He knew Scandinavian languages. And so, in a sense, this was a poet who was always conscious of the universe of literature surrounding him. And that informs his poetry, that informs his writing, that informs his thinking. And he started out, as I said, at Bowdoin College and went to Europe for a couple of years to pick up more languages, to become fluent in the languages that he was supposed to teach. He didn't stay at Bowdoin College. In 1834, he became the Smith Professor of Modern Languages at Harvard University. And he taught at Harvard until about 1854, when he resigned from his position, which is a very interesting little fact about him that, you know, it's probably the only poet I know who resigned a professorship at an Ivy League school because he was making enough money with his poetry, which he was. He was a tremendously successful poet. And that's something that one needs to remember as well when one of his most famous poems, The Song of Hiawatha, that's how he wanted it to be pronounced published in 1855. Within just a couple of months, he earned $4,000 just from the sales, and that would be $105,000 in today's money. That's really quite remarkable in terms of sales, if you look at a period of just like four months or something like that. At the height of his fame in 1877, when he sold the poem to Harper's, he got $1,000 for that, which is about $23,000 in today's money. So if you're just looking at sales, Longfellow is probably unsurpassed in the history of American literature in terms of the money that he commanded for poetry, really. And after he resigned from Harvard, he remained a professional poet, somebody who limited himself to poetry, which is also important for understanding the place of a poem like Paul Revere's Ride in his work. He's not somebody who weighed in publicly through political pronouncements, even through book reviews or in any other form. Poetry was the medium through which he spoke to his readers. And he was tremendously popular in the United States, but also abroad. He had readers writing to him from all over the world, letters from India. He had a huge following in England. Travelers from all over the world would come and stop at his house. And he was a very hospitable man. He would always welcome people. Poets from Cuba came to Cambridge. Longfellow was the place where they went to talk to him, to get an autograph from him, and so forth. It's very difficult for us to recreate the kind of position that he had in society. You know, he was the kind of guy when he went to the opera, people would look towards where he was sitting to see if he would applaud and the newspapers would report on that. So really a celebrity poet, our first genuine celebrity poet, really. Longfellow sounds as though he was unique in that he was a celebrity poet. Was poetry popular when he entered into his profession or did Longfellow help make poetry popular? 
Well, there were poets before him who were tremendously popular. Lydia Sigourney, the sweet singer of Hartford, as she's sometimes called, was an extremely popular poet. And she complained, actually, in her autobiography about the many requests she would get from readers, the letters she would receive. People ask her to write poetry for them, poetry made to order, and she complained about that. But Longfellow, in a sense, was able to develop a language that respected, in a sense, demands of literature as a profession, while also appealing to ordinary readers. So, in a sense, and this is something that we don't remember so much about Longfellow, he was a supreme craftsman. So he would not produce shoddy work, but he would do that in a language that would appeal to the common man and the common woman, actually. So he did, in fact, create a kind of poetry that appealed to the middle ground of readers, not elites, so much as people who looked for poetry to help them live their lives in a way. So one thing that we probably also need to understand about 19th century poetry, this was not something that only a few and highly educated people did. People just wrote poetry. It was part of ordinary life. Abraham Lincoln wrote poetry. So it was not something that you needed special training for or that only a few people could do. It was something that the masses would have an appreciation for. But Longfellow gave them what they wanted with the understanding they were getting it from someone who cared for them, who was responsive to their needs, but would also give them the best possible value for their money. And that's something that makes them unique. So there are lines in Longfellow's poetry that even we remember today, into each life a little rain must fall, let us then be up and doing, each thing in its place is best. And when you take these lines out of context, they sound trivial, they sound banal in a way. But you have to, in a sense, imagine them in the context of a poem that really reinforces the kinds of things that you are wondering about as you go about your daily business. So Longfellow's poetry was not intended to tell you that you must change your life. As Whitman, for instance, implies, you know, Whitman says, you know, if you stop this day and night with me and you shall possess the origin of all poems, he's essentially saying, I am the origin of poetry. I'm a prophet in a way. I can tell you truths that otherwise wouldn't be clear to you. Longfellow is giving his readers what they want, but he's giving them that truth wrapped in a poem that just makes them feel appreciated, that makes them feel supported. And collectively, if you think of these readers sort of letting literature into their lives, making them part of their lives, he does change things a little bit. He does elevate them. He does tell them, you know, when they find their worries, their sorrows reflected in a poem, that their life is part of the literary world, too, that he knows about you, he appreciates you, he welcomes you into the fold of great literary things. In 1863, Longfellow published a collection of poems called Tales of a Wayside Inn. Would you tell us about this particular collection? That was Longfellow's attempt to create an American equivalent to Boccaccio's De Camerone or Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So while Longfellow was always interested in European literature, he was also adamant that American poets, American writers had to create something that would reflect America, that would reflect the unique needs of his own country. And that's sort of the conceit that he got from Chaucer or Boccaccio, for that matter. Six travelers meet at the Wayside Inn in Sudbury, which is still around today. I think it's America's longest still operating inn. And because of bad weather, they're essentially stuck at this inn. They sit around the fireplace and they swap tales. And they're joined by the innkeeper, a man whose name was in real life Lyman Howe. He had actually just died a few years before Longfellow published his collection. And among those travelers are the poet, who is modeled on Thomas Parsons, who was a Boston dentist and poet as well. The Sicilian, who was modeled on one of Longfellow's own language teachers at Harvard, Luigi Monti. One of the things that Longfellow did, which is kind of interesting, he sort of pioneered what we now think of as immersion in foreign languages. So he would hire native speakers to teach languages at Harvard. Luigi Monti was one of them. The theologian, modeled on a Harvard professor named Daniel Treadwell. The musician, modeled on Oli Bull, a Norwegian violinist, basically a rock star in his own time. A Spanish Jew, based on a Boston dealer in Oriental goods, and a Harvard student, Henry W. Wales. So these names, they are not mentioned in the work itself, but it's very clear that these are the people that he had in mind. 
And the setting of the tails that they swap over a period of a couple of days is quite capacious. So we have Italy, we have Spain, we have Norway, we have what's now considered France, we have the Orient. But the collection starts and ends with a New England tale. So the first tale is, in fact, Paul Revere's ride. And when the collection was done, Longfellow published it in three installments. The first one was 1863. And then there were two other installments that he published later, part two and part three. And when in 1872, 1873, when the collection was done, the last tale was also a New England tale, The Rhyme of Sir Christopher. So the frame in sense for the collection is New England. And these tales are told by the landlord, by the innkeeper, keeper of the Sudbury Inn. And it's a little odd that Longfellow is starting this in 1863 because the Civil War is going on essentially. And it seems sort of like a retreat from reality. But what happens when you read the collection, and that's so fascinating about it, is that the tales actually are not particularly cheerful, many of them. There's a tale that's about the Spanish Inquisition in which an elderly father denounces his daughters as heretics and actually volunteers to light the fire that will burn them. Or the Birds of Killingworth, which is a really interesting tale, kind of an environmental fable, is about a fictitious town in Connecticut where the residents decide to kill their birds in order to protect their crops. But what they then find is that everything that's interesting about their lives and about their environment is gone. The birds are silent, which is essentially what Rachel Carson and Silent Spring picks up on. And then they have to import the birds again. It's sort of a fable about environmental destruction, but also about immigration. You know, America needs the kind of influx of people from the outside. The birds are, you know, birds of passage that come to this community and enrich it. So it's actually a collection that on a subliminal level is quite political when you think about it. And that's where Paul Revere fits in as well. It's a republished poem Longfellow publishes in the Atlantic Monthly a few years before this collection comes out. But it's kind of interesting to see Revere in the context of this collection. Yeah. Could you tell us more about the role Paul Revere's ride played within the context of the Tales of the Wayside Inn? Also, why did Longfellow choose to write a poem specifically about Paul Revere? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting question. I mean, we do know that a few months before he finished writing the poem, that he, in fact, went on a little excursion to the North End. And he goes on this walk, or kind of a little expedition with George Sumner, the younger brother of his very good friend, Charles Sumner, the great senator, civil rights activist, and so forth. And he and George go over to the North End, and they go to the burial ground, which is actually mentioned in the poem, take a look at the tomb of Cotton Mather, and then proceed to the Old North Church and climb to the tower as the bells are chiming. He writes about this in his journal, and they disturb the pigeons that are in the tower. And then he obviously looks down and takes in the view. So that's probably the inspiration for the tale. What might be interesting, too, to remember is that Longfellow is writing this right on the eve of the Civil War, really. In fact, he finished writing it on October 13, 1860. And two weeks later, he goes and casts his vote for Lincoln. And he's very excited about having done this. He says, freedom is triumphant. So there is a political kind of framework within which he thinks about Revere. He picks on a Revere because this is someone who is not known at the time. We now think of him as sort of pivotal to the beginning of the War of Independence, but really this was not a consensus at the time. And I think he wanted to write a poem that stresses the importance of the individual, of individual action, individual responsibility, which is something he feels very keenly is important as America is entering into the Civil War, which is a catastrophe for Longfellow in the sense he wants slavery, of course, to be gone, but he's also a pacifist. And he has this enormous conflict that's going on with him. You know, he abhors violence, yet he realizes there's no way around it. And Within that sort of general framework of this looming war, he figures that it's important for everyone to remember how history works and what is important in history. Paul Revere's ride came out, actually the issue in the Atlantic Monthly came out in January 1861, but in fact it was available in the stores in December already, December 20th, and that was exactly the day South Carolina had seceded from the Union. So to kind of create a sort of national icon, but somebody who at the same time is an individual agent who acts 
because of his conviction. That's a very important metaphor for Longfellow. You mentioned that Longfellow chose to write about someone who was relatively unknown. And in 1860, that unknown someone was Paul Revere, a common guy who played this kind of important role at the start of the revolution that no one knew about. This information, plus Longfellow's expedition into the north end of Boston, Revere's home neighborhood, makes it seem like Longfellow did his research. Do you know how much research Longfellow conducted before he wrote his poem? Did he actually read Revere's accounts of his ride at the Massachusetts Historical Society? There's a letter that Paul Revere wrote in 1798 to Jeremy Belknap, who was the founder of the Massachusetts Historical Society, in which he talks, in which he discusses the ride. Most scholars, I don't think, are aware or have looked at the issue of the journal in which this account actually was published. And there was the New England Magazine, October 1832. And the letter is actually embedded in an account of Paul Revere as a silversmith. It's an article really about early American artists and mechanics. And Revere figures as a silversmith in that article. And Longfellow, in that same issue of the New England Magazine, actually has a publication. You usually read that he had a poem published, but that's not true. He had a story about a schoolmaster that was published in the same issue. So he would have seen it, you know, because Longfellow is just starting out as a poet. And of course, being published in New England Magazine is not a trivial matter for him. So he would have picked up this issue and looked at it. And indeed, the Revere was known as a silversmith. And one interesting little detail about this is that Longfellow who was a collector who liked antiquarian things, that we do have references in his letters to him buying Paul Revere's silver spoons. He acquires them once as a wedding present, once apparently just for himself because he likes having them. So there's this other identity of Revere that was totally familiar to Longfellow. So he does read this account and we know for sure that he knew it because there's in fact a letter, I think to an unidentified correspondent, April 28, 1877, where he, in fact, quotes this account or refers this correspondent to this particular letter. So that we know for sure, that he knew Revere's account. Now, there's a couple of things about Revere's account that we need to be aware of. First of all, this was written after the fact as well in 1798, as I said. So Revere's recollection is probably not the most precise anymore either. But one thing that, you know, we need to remember about Longfellow is that he was completely aware of the fact that he was changing the historical record, that he was taking liberties. He really didn't care. He was first and foremost a poet, and that to him was the most important thing. And as I said earlier, he wanted to write a story about individual responsibility, individual agency. The fact that he eliminated, there was a second writer, William Dawes, that he eliminated that, that he had Paul Revere arrive in Concord at 2 a.m. in the morning, whereas Revere, in fact, never made it there because he was detained in Lexington. That was, in a sense, irrelevant to Longfellow. He does this in other poems as well. Evangeline was very loosely based on the historical record, and he took extreme liberties with it, inventing a character that afterwards people thought was real. Evangeline, the protagonist, Hiawasa is cobbled together from very different native myths, and he's taking incredible liberties with those. He felt that poets could do that. And in fact, when he was beginning to be challenged about what he'd done in Paul Revere, there was a book published by Henry W. Holland in 1878, William Dawes and his ride with Paul Revere. And Holland wanted to recover William Dawes and was faulting Longfellow for having left William Dawes out of the poem. He wrote very ironically to his friend George Washington Green that Holland has convicted me of high historic crimes and misdemeanors, as he said. He felt that this is really what poets can do. One of my favorite little items in Longfellow's papers is a letter from a nine-year-old girl who writes to Longfellow about one of his poems, The Wreck of the Hesperus. And she asks him what it means that the ship jumped a cable's length, as Longfellow says in the poem. And Longfellow explains that a cable's length is about 700 feet, and that's very unlikely that a ship can actually make a leap across that distance. But then he says to this nine-year-old girl, he says, it's a poem, and in poetry you must not expect exact things. And he says, poets like children exaggerate, and they make things larger than they are, as for instance, when they say the waves ran mountain high. So he's basically saying, remember that poets are not historians, and that poets are not limited to what the historical record tells them. 
So he was aware of what he'd done. It was not sloppy research. It was an attempt to sort of fashion his own version of a story. And in fact, he reflects on this in the poem when he comes back at the end of the poem to what the historical record is. And he says, you know the rest. That's not so important. What you don't know is the story that I'm telling you. So it sounds like for Longfellow, Paul Revere's ride was more about the art and message of his poetry than it was an attempt to create some sort of national myth, which is ultimately what his poem would become. Yes and no. For him, literature had a part to play in the national consciousness. And he was convinced, as obscure as this might sound, that if you open yourselves to poetry, it'll do something to you. It'll play a role in your life that actually helps forge a sense of a nation that's different from the one that most people experience. He was really convinced that it was important to remember the United States was a composite nation, was made up of so many different traditions, so many different cultures, so many different stories. And it was the function of the poet to sort of revive these stories and to make these stories central to our lives and to have us experience through these stories something that is meaningful And it will also make us, in a sense, more relevant, more capable citizens. The ending of his poem, Evangeline, he has the two lovers that are protagonists in the poem. They are buried in the middle of Philadelphia. And he describes how people are rushing by their graves, not realizing that there's the story right next to them, a story that will actually talk to them in their busy lives and tell them something about themselves. And it's the same thing with Paul Revere. Paul Revere is someone who is basically like we are, but he decides to take action. And we see him as we follow him through the poem, as we follow him through the nightscape of these little villages, you know, Medford, Lexington, and so forth. These are places people knew. And we are with him. We watch the landscape with him. We feel the morning breeze on our skin with him. And that's really what he wants to put us right there. And at the end, when Paul Revere successfully arrives, you know, Longfellow basically says, you know, we know this. We know these types of things. We know, as he says in the poem, the knock at the door. And I'm really convinced that Longfellow was talking about an experience that was quite familiar to him as well. The knock in the middle of the night at the door. This is something that Longfellow experienced, too. He was a supporter of the Underground Railroad. This is a part of Longfellow that we really don't know so well. And people would knock at his door in the middle of the night, and he would come and get money from him. He supported fugitive slaves, and people would collect money from him personally that went to those slaves. And that, to me, is a highly relevant part of the poem. So I won't say this is just about poetry. It is about poetry, but poetry for Longfellow in an indirect sense, in a sense that's probably a little difficult to understand today, did have a political function, an indirectly political function. Reading poetry does something to us. Reading poetry transforms us not through what the poem tells us, but through the experience of sharing this particular poem. It's very important to me that we don't just think of this as Longfellow telling a story and it becomes immediately a national myth. It did become a national myth later in the century. One misconception that you get even in more recent books about Paul Revere's ride is that this was an instantly popular poem. It was fairly popular. People liked anything that Longfellow did. And so, of course, people responded to it. But it became this kind of national thing only later in the century, when, you know, at the height of immigration and so forth, when people tried to fashion these kinds of national myths. But I don't think Longfellow sat down and said to himself, okay, I'm going to create a national myth now. What he sat down to write is a poem about action, about taking responsibility, really about History History is not stories that we tell and retell. History is what we make of it. And if you listen to the poem, if you listen very carefully, this is a poem about paying attention to details. It's a poem about the night, about silence, about the hoofbeats of the horse, about the windows of the meeting house that Revere rides past and the spectral glare sort of affects him and us. This is what history is. History is not sort of some grand narrative. History happens. One night when one guy gets on a horse, determines to make a difference, and the poem puts us right there with him. I think that's what he wanted to do. Do you think that's why we find Paul Revere's ride so captivating today? Because the poem is what we make of it, that we can use it to experience Revere's ride and ultimately the American Revolution right alongside with him? 
I think so. I mean, if you just think about the kind of impressions the poem creates in our minds, and I'm not sure that kids, you know, who are forced to learn it by heart and recite it if they get all that. But if you just take a step back and see what the poem does, I mean, we got sounds, we got the muffled oar, we got walking, running, galloping, the tramp of feet, the measured tread, the night wind, the stealthy tread, heavy stride, the hurry of hooves, the tramp of his steed, you know, the sound. There's the crowing of the cock, there's a barking dog, and then there's a knock at the door at the end. And there's visual impressions, the British ship that cuts across the moon like prison bars, the shapes of shade that are made by the pigeons as they escape, the glimmer that then becomes a gleam, the spark that's struck out by a horse, the weathercock swimming in the moonlight, and then we have tactile experiences, Revere feeling the breath of the morning breeze. That's Longfellow really telling us this is what history is composed of. Don't forget, this is a poem that's intended for children. He says right at the beginning, the speaker says, listen, my children. So he's telling them this is what history is made for. It's made for people who know how to listen and to watch carefully with eager ears, as he says. So essentially, he's saying that this is what history is about. It's about silence. It's about sounds. It's about all those types of things. And he's telling us to open ourselves to it because that'll change something about the way we respond to events. And I think that's part of why the poem has survived. It is actually a very good poem, once you forget about what people have done with it, and you know the way it's been sort of retooled in all sorts of celebratory contexts, and the way politicians have cited it, and so forth. That is, I think, a really, really important aspect of it. And that's frankly something that Martin Luther King got when he quoted Paul Revere, and he said, we need something like that for our national conscience. We need a writer like that who carries the message. It's really about heightened sensitivity to the world around us. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was a poet, not a historian. But like a historian, he found useful information within the historical record that could tell us something about who we are and how we came to be who we are as Americans. Longfellow found the story of Paul Revere, a relatively unknown, hardworking silversmith with a diverse family heritage. Revere is nearly someone all of us can relate to in one way or another, and he's someone we can imagine ourselves being. This is precisely why Longfellow chose to write a poem about Revere. Longfellow wanted someone like us, someone with a good, unknown story that would enable us to see the truth in what Longfellow had to tell us. History is not about the stories we tell and retell. History is what happens when individual people like us decide to take action and make a difference. And because we're all capable of taking action and of making a difference, we're also all capable of making history. This is a big reason why Paul Revere and his April 18 ride to Lexington has had such an odd staying power in our national memory. Unlike George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and other people from the founding era, Paul Revere is relatable. Thanks to Longfellow and, as Jane noted, John Singleton Copley, we can see Paul Revere and imagine taking part in the revolution alongside with him. Now, it's not that Revere's September ride to Philadelphia in 1774 or his work as a silversmith, foundry operator, and copper roller are unimportant. As Patrick related, these are important pieces of Revere's history. But that's just it. They're facts from the historical record. And while these facts have something valuable to tell us, they're not as relatable as our national memory needs them to be to make them stick in our minds. Historical or national memory is organic and selective. Its purpose is to give us stories from the past that we can use to bind ourselves together as a people. On the night of April 18, 1775, Paul Revere, a guy just like us, allowed his convictions for what he felt needed to be done to override the fear and danger he faced from British patrols so that he could take action and make a difference. This is a story we can relate to, and a story that binds us together as a people, because it's a story about an American like us, an American who took action and made a difference. This is the kind of story our national memory likes to remember and to tell us. Now, as Christoph stated, literature has a role to play in our national consciousness. So too do history and national memory. Combined, all three can provide us with a full and powerful picture of who we are and how we came to be who we are, especially, as Sarah noted, when we take the time to look at them through the context of history. Because it's history that tells us why we tell the story of Paul Revere's ride the way we do, and why it comes into and out of popularity the way it has since 1860. In essence, 
It's history that tells us why Paul Revere rides quickly into our historical consciousness when he does, and then just as quickly out of it. Thank you for joining me for another preview of the Doing History to the Revolution series. This series is meant to help us explore not just what is the history of the American Revolution, but what are the histories of the American Revolution. The full series will debut in fall 2017. For more information about the Doing History to the Revolution series, as well as about Paul Revere and the guest scholars we just spoke with, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com 130. You've been telling me a lot lately that you wish some of our conversations would last a bit longer. Well, I have some good news for you. In addition to preparing a detailed bibliography, historical images, and documents to go with this episode, the Omohundro Institute and I have also made available nearly 20 minutes of extra interview content from this episode. You can access all of these bonus features through the OI Reader app. The OI Reader app is free and available for all iOS tablets and Android devices. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash doing history for more information about the OI Reader and for direct links to the app in the Google Play and Apple App Stores. And if you don't have an Android device or iOS tablet, send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, and we'll do our best to get you access to these bonus materials. Doing history is a collaborative effort, and the Omohundro Institute recognizes this, which is why they help make this episode possible with financial, technical, and historical support. In fact, the OI has formed a Doing History team to help me produce these episodes. So thank you to the Omohundro Institute and the Doing History team for all your help with this episode. And if you'd like to say thank you too, which is always appreciated, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash doinghistory to learn more about the Omohundro Institute. Finally, what other stories from history in our national memory do you think we should be paying attention to right now in our present day? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.